thank you for this class. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to, to grow and to stretch ourselves. I pray that you will be with us uh, as a class. I pray that all those who aren't here, Lord, that you will bring them in and, and help us to have a full uh, and fruitful semester. And Lord, I pray you let this uh, be influential in our lives, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this is the syllabus. Okay. So what we'll do is I'll take a few minutes and we'll go over the syllabus real quick, and then uh, and then we'll jump into an initial kind of opening lesson. All right. So the idea of this class is archaeology, right? So we're going to be looking um, not just archaeology, but, but kind of the history connected to the archaeology. Uh, and th this is an intentionally really broad title that I gave this class just so that I could have some freedom to delve into some of the more interesting subjects. And so uh, as far as the assignments, so let me just kind of go through that in the textbook and then we'll, we'll jump into uh, what we mean by archaeology and where we're going to head for this class. So uh, it's it's going to be about 12 weeks long. We're not doing a, a break in between, um, so it's actually about a week or so uh, quicker than normal because normally we have some kind of a spring break. Um, all right, okay. So discussion board, if you, if you don't have a password for the internet, uh, for the website, you can get that from Nalissa before you leave. Uh, so basically what it is, we film every class, uh, and you can then log on. Uh, you can watch any weeks that you missed. Uh, when it comes time for the final, you can go back in and rewatch the lessons as far as studying. And then submission of assignments is through the website. Uh, so you would upload it just like you would attach something to an email. You just kind of attach it and, and email it to me and it will come right to me. Um, so we're doing a couple of things here. So you'll see in week three that you have uh, discussion board one. So on the discussion boards, basically what that is, is I will put a question up that has to do either with something from your reading or something that we've discussed. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a, it's not quite a chat room, but it's something where you can see everyone else's answer, right? So it's going to, it's going to post them in. And so you'll see everyone else's answer. And so what I'm looking for is this is just kind of a, a little way for you guys to have some interaction and see each other's thoughts outside of the class. So there's four of these. They don't have to be real long. I give you kind of on the back page, I give you guidelines. Uh, just two to four hundred words is all I'm looking for. Uh, so that's a paragraph or two uh, in answer to the question. So it's just some aside uh, assignment uh, that you do. So you log in, click on the discussion board, it'll pull up the question, you'll see the other students' responses, and then you just post your response in there. There are uh, two papers for this class. Uh, one is a contemporary dig site research paper. So let me go over that one first. Um, as you can see on the back of the, your page, there I have the assignment uh, guidelines, right? So uh, three pages, two sources. Um, so basically, uh, you're going to want to do a little bit of research, not too much. It's only two sources. So you're going to do some research. We're looking at three pages. Um, the main thing of what I want out of this paper is to get you um, exploring Israel's homepage, right? So uh, you would start off by going to, I want to say it's Israel.gov, something like that. So the, the Israel's homepage, I might even be able to put a link for this later. Um, or you can Google current dig sites in Israel, something to that effect. Um, And it will take you, as long as it's on the Israel.gov homepage. So basically, the way Israel runs this is there's so much archaeological work going on in Israel. It's such a big part of the nation that the government oversees all of it quite um, in depth. So the government has a kind of a heavy hand and a lot of involvement on the archaeological dig sites. So in order to dig in Israel, you have to have a permit, and it has to be a government-sponsored or at least government recognized dig in order for it to be legal. And so at any given time, they may have 12 to 15 biblical cities that are being excavated at any one time. 
And so on the government's homepage, they have a list of all of the current cities that are being excavated right now. Um, and so you click on one of those links and it will take you probably to another website just for that specific dig, right? And so what you're doing for this paper is I want you to do some research on one of those cities. So when you go to Israel's homepage, you're going to find potentially 15 different um, dig sites to choose from. And so it's kind of neat because some of these, uh, I remember one year I taught this class, it was about five years ago, but they had a dig site going on in uh, the field where David fought Goliath, right, in that general area. Um, Hebron is a city that has been excavated for at least 10 or 12 years, maybe 15. I think that one's probably still going on. Hebron is where Abraham uh, lived when he had many of God's covenants. It's where the patriarchs are buried, um, just to the side of that. Um, it is the one of the cities that the Israelites were scared to enter the promised land because the giants lived there at one point. Uh, it is the place that Caleb went to fight uh, these giants and took it as a city for Israel. It's where David was anointed um, uh, to be king of Israel and to be king of Judah in his earlier anointing. And so a lot went on at Hebron. And so that one is being excavated. And so basically what I'm wanting you to do is do some research on one of these sites. It's really just to get you familiar with what's going on in Israel currently in terms of archaeology. So a lot of my lectures are going to be things that have already taken place, archaeological digs that have already gone on, what we found, what we, what we know. Um, but I'd like you to also be familiar with the current state of affairs. Uh, and then one thing you'll see on there is that with any of these, they're always looking for volunteers. So that may be something down the road. Uh, I know it's something I'd like to do at some point um, is to take a a work vacation. Uh, generally they charge you about $300 a week, um, but that covers your food and your room and board. And you would work, you know, say if you paid for two weeks, you would be there and you would be, you know, probably menial tasks like moving dirt, but you'd be there with your hands in the dirt in Hebron where David was anointed, digging out the, the rooms uh, that were there when he was there, right? Uh, and so the, that's open. And so for all, every one of these 15 sites, and, and all of them have a story. Every city has a story. Because most of the ones that they're focusing their attention on would have been larger cities because there's only so much money available um, to do these dig sites. So all of these cities are going to have a story and they've got a reason why they're there. Um, and so that's really what I'm wanting you to look at. Give me some background about the dig site. What have they found? Um, since they've been there. So whichever one you pick, just, just do about one so that you can get enough in-depth study on, on whichever one you pick. If you pick too many, a three-page paper, you're, you're just not really giving much content if you pick more than one. So just pick one of these sites and just talk to me. Show me through the paper that you are familiar with what has gone on there and what's going on there and what this city is. So uh, you may have a section on the background of that particular city, like why is it important? What happened there in the Bible that makes them want to dig there? Um, what have they found there? Maybe you might find some research on what methods they've used. You might talk about what time periods that they've been able to reach, right? So uh, this is clearly a mound in Israel. and the way that these archaeological digs work is they're often mounds, right? So that's that's the first telltale sign that people have lived somewhere is there's a mound like out in a field. Um, and they're not they're not uh, natural, they're man-made and basically it started off typically there might be some source of water somewhere near and so ancient people built something there and because the site had some kind of strategic value, either it was high on a mountain or uh, had access to a major road, access to major water. For whatever reason that the original people built here, everyone else would have wanted to be in the same spot. So they would typically just build then on top of previous layers. And so this was very common, uh, particularly in Israel, because it is not a large country. It's smaller than the state of Florida. Uh, it's 180 miles by 60 miles. Um, so it's it's about the size of 
central Florida, you know, from maybe North Miami down to the, up to the Panhandle. So it's not a real big nation. And so a lot of the biblical stories take place in the same spots over and over again. Uh, and so that's, in my mind, one of the interesting ways to draw a lot of revelation out of the Bible is if I see that something has gone on in one spot, I will often search through the Word trying to find what happened in this city at later points, and you'll often see a lot of overlap that, that there are some neat things that God did with these people, and there's very similar things that He did with these people in that same site. So anyways, that's, that's for Bible study, that's an interesting thing, is to go back in and look at what has happened in a particular city over the course of its lifetime, because the Bible tends to go up, not out. Right, that, that the, the boundaries of the promised land have never really extended much. In fact, there's been very few times that they've even ever approached what God gave them as their actual boundary when they first entered the promised land. Um, when God was speaking to Abraham about the land that they would have, he said from the Euphrates to the river in Egypt being the Nile Delta, he said, I give that to you. They've never really had any of, you know, all of that. Uh, and so... They've never quite expanded much outside. Probably the, the largest that they've ever been would have been during Solomon's day. Um, and then from then on out, they they tended to retract quite a bit, um, particularly once the nation split during Rehoboam. Then, then you'd have back and forth. Sometimes Israel would be large. Sometimes Judah would be large. But so anyways, for archaeology purposes, things tend to go up. So on this paper, the reason that that's important is because they're going to talk to you about what level they are at currently in that city. So if they're if they're excavating Hebron, they may not even made it to have made it to David's time yet. They could still be up here because for us, David is more interesting than other people that have lived in Hebron. But for an archaeological team, they can't skip over periods. Um, in good conscience, right? So even though the headlines would rather see some of this stuff down here, closer to David's time and the patriarchs, because we know those people, they will take it one layer at a time in, a, in an excavation. So on these websites, this is something that you can address in the paper, is what is the expected time frame that they are excavating, right? So at any given time, they're going to excavate different layers, right? And so so they will tell you we think we're in uh you know Iron Age two or Iron Age one um or early bronze. We'll get into what those time periods are, but they, they will explain and so each year or two of the dig they may hit a different level, right? Um and so and they'll expect to find different types of things as they go down and so they have to kind of feel like they've mapped all of this level, and then they'll remove it, and then come down to this level. So it's kind of an interesting process of unraveling the history of a particular mound, right? So anyway, so in your, in your dig sites, that's, that's what you're looking at there. Okay. Then the second one is archaeological findings paper. Uh, that will be more in line with the types of things that we're discussing in the class. So a lot of the lectures that I'll do will be on things that we have pulled up out of the ground, what they say, what is their significance. Um, and so along those same lines, then I'm going to want you, you can either do it on something that I've taught in the class, or you can do it on something new to kind of stretch your thinking. If you do it on something that I talked about in the class, then I would expect more thoroughness, because the general idea I will have already explained in the class. Um, and so, but but something that they found. So, uh, perhaps uh, a, a stele of some kind. A stele is a like a it almost looks like a tombstone or something. It's a flat kind of uh, piece of stone that they would often use as a as a advertisement. So they might often when they would do a wall, they might use just general stones for the thickness of the wall. And then when it came time to do the decorating, uh, think hieroglyphics in Egypt, they would cut two-inch thick 
pieces of stone to do the interior wall, and that would be the part that would get decorated. So a stele is often some kind of monument. It could either be part of a wall or it could be standalone, and they would inscribe on this piece of stone uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, battles, uh, business dealings that were important, lots of things that would make their way onto these stone monuments. Um, we'll talk later about Assyria. Assyria was a nation in northern, on the northern border of Israel and they were notorious for making these long records and so the majority of information that we have from biblical about biblical cities actually doesn't come from biblical cities it comes from Assyria because Assyria kept such excellent records right? in fact Assyria is what is being destroyed currently by ISIS right so these places that ISIS is destroying were ancient Assyria right and so um, a lot of important things I, I want to say they blew up Nineveh the other day uh, which was one of the you know the capital of it would have been the, the Washington DC if you will of the Bible days you know the capital of the world power was Nineveh um, and so I, I believe they, they've blown up most of that just this year um, where Jonah went to preach was Nineveh and it was a massive city it was a three-day journey from one side to the other uh, that's how big the city was so for for antiquity to have a city that large was was almost unheard of uh, but so anyways uh, so these steles were kind of monuments that have survived down to today and they always tell some kind of a story so that could be an example of something that you could write about as one of those that we found um, you could write about a city that's been excavated. You could write about, um, I, I would probably stay away from things like the Ark of the Covenant because we haven't actually found it. So there's a lot of stories about the search. Same thing with Noah's Ark. Um, there's some people that think they know where it is, but, but there's nothing definitive. So when you're looking at something archaeological, let's stick with things that, um, that at the end of the day you can say you know what it was and where they found it. Uh, so some of the more, the things like the Ark of the Covenant and, and that kind of stuff very well might be out there, but if they are, we don't really know exactly where they're at. So I'd rather uh, stick to things that um, that you can you can kind of verify. So that's the, that's the papers, right? So we're going to have one that is on a dig site and one that's on something interesting that we found. Something, it, doesn't, it can be anything that you find interesting that archaeology has produced, right? Okay. And then you have a final at the end. Uh, the way I do my finals um, might be different than other people. I tend to, I will give you a review the week of the final that is basically word for word what your final is, right? So my philosophy on finals has never been to make it a, a secret. Um, I've always felt that the final is the core of the information that I want you to learn. So I make it very plain and I say this is what I think you should know and I think you should know this and I'll go all the way through probably 25 questions of things that I think you should have gotten out of the class and if you can replicate that information on the final then I feel good about it. I think sometimes when I always thought that when in, in school when people would give me a final and they didn't tell me what was on it I studied all over the place and some stuff I studied wasn't as important as other things because I had to make sure I knew everything and so I always wanted to make it very plain what were on my finals so that you spend your time studying the stuff that I deem to be the most important from the lectures, right? So, so your final may require a lot of, of typing as you're answering the things, but it won't be a surprise. You'll know exactly what the questions are going to be. And I will have a, a discussion in the final review uh, about each one of them. And there'll probably be maybe only five questions where I say, hey, go back in and watch the film on this one and put the answer into your own words. But you'll know what the question is, right? Okay. So any, any questions over what is expected in this class? You've got your discussion boards, your papers. The reading quiz, oh, and in the book is, is called Secrets of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, this is it here. Uh, so look for, for this cover. Uh, Randall Price is a he's a Christian and he is 
an archaeologist, but his kind of doctoral work was in the area of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so he actually had a lot of hands-on experience. He's actually an archaeologist that's done a lot more than just the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but this is an area especially for him. So I, the way I do the textbooks is I don't teach from the book, right? Um, I use the book as something uh, that is a supplement to what I am teaching. So I probably won't deal at all much with what's covered in that book because we only have so much time and so many weeks. Um, I use the textbooks as a supplement to what I'm teaching here. So some people do it different. Some people teach from a book. Um, I tend to use the book to cover an area that then I won't have to cover in the lectures. So it's kind of an addition to what I'm teaching instead of um, teaching the same thing from the book. Um, so I felt like this was a really good one. There's a lot of, uh, of mystery connected with the Dead Sea Scrolls. A lot of people know that they were important, uh, but you may or may not know what they even were. Uh, I, I want to say there's like 800 uh, different works that could be categorized under the title of a Dead Sea Scroll. And so it's it's all kinds of stuff. It's biblical works, uh, it's treasure maps, it's um, it's business, there's all kinds of stuff that were uh, discovered. And then there's a whole uh, adventure behind it. I don't know if you know this or not, but it was almost 40 years um, after the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls before they even published what was in them. And so for a long time there was a lot of conspiracy theorists kind of things like, hey, why aren't they telling us what's in these things and why did it take 40 years for them to let anybody know what it was that they found? Um, and so he goes over a lot of that. A lot of it was just simply um, the thoroughness because they knew the whole world was watching them and so each fragment they would spend tons of time on so they could be above reproach from the scholarly world. They knew the world was watching them. And then the other thing is, is they started with just a handful of about maybe eight people or so. It was just too much of a job for them. But because the prestige was so high, nobody wanted to let go of manuscripts they had been assigned as the only one who could review them. Because there was a, in the academic world, there was a lot of prestige with being the one who was doing the report on one of these scrolls. And so these eight men, a lot of times, didn't want to give up the responsibility. And I think the, the Israelite government kind of stepped in and kind of forced some other scholars into the picture um, so they'd get it done faster. Um, and, and so then it was, it was published, you know. So anyways, but there's a whole story behind how they were discovered. Um, they were discovered over many years. So the Dead Sea Scrolls is actually more like 12 different discoveries from the same part of the world. Um, and so he goes over individual discoveries. And so I will probably leave a lot of that alone um, and you'll get that from the book. But it's, it's really an interesting story. It's an important part um, of our history uh, primarily because prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls discovery, a major question that plagued biblical studies was how do you know that when Isaiah wrote this in 722 BC, right, that what he wrote is the same thing that we have now in uh, the year 2000 or 1947 when a lot of these were, were being unearthed. Um, how do you know that it didn't get changed? Because there was all kinds of corruption in the Middle Ages, all kinds of, of issues going on. And so there was always that question in the back of people's minds is how do we know the copies we have today weren't changed somewhere along the line? I mean, that's almost 3,000 years of history with all kinds of people before us that had questionable motives. Um, there were times when uh, people weren't allowed to have copies of the Bible and the people who had them had questionable motives. And so there was always that thought of, do we have confidence in the Bible that we have? The Dead Sea Scrolls, many of them were from 200 BC, which is uh, a couple hundred years before the time of Christ. Um, and we have copies of, of every book of the Bible, of the Old Testament obviously, this is before Christ, except for Esther. 
Esther was the only one that they weren't able to find. They're not entirely sure why. Some people think it was because Esther doesn't mention the name of God anywhere. Uh, it's the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention the name of God. Um, but it could just be as simple as, other than the books of Moses, most of them only kept about one copy, right? So they, they considered the Pentateuch and the major prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah to be on a, a more, I don't want to say a higher class, but they were used daily. And so those copies were uh, widely spread in these biblical communities. So the, you know, the, the Torah, which is the five books of the Bible, and the major prophets were ones that people read on a daily basis. And so they would wear out faster, which meant they had to have more copies of them on hand. Whereas smaller books like Esther, they may have only kept one copy in the community. And so, you know, 3,000 years later, with the ravages of time, some of these smaller books just didn't entirely make it. So it's possible Esther just didn't survive. And it may not have been that they had anything against that one particular book. Uh, so the idea is that in 200 BC, we discovered full copies of Isaiah and the books of the Pentateuch that are word for word what we still have today. And so the gap disappeared, right? So from 200 BC to 1947, all that mystery of what could have happened during those time period is gone now because we found things from before that time period that are word for word what we have today and it gives a lot of credibility to the Old Testament scribes ability to maintain the integrity of the Bible through all of these years. So this was huge to eliminate that question of what could have changed through the years because a lot of people that wanted to doubt the Bible would point to the Middle Ages when many of the popes were scrupulous characters. You know, they, they weren't they weren't anyone uh, that you would want to emulate, uh, and so who knows what they were doing, right? You know, and so the idea is, you know, what what did they change, right, when they had the chance? And so now we know that they didn't change anything, and that that God was able to keep the Bible intact from this time to this time. And so now the gap from what we have to when it was written is narrowed down to only about 500 years, right? And so that's that's a big jump, um, and so. Isaiah was the 700s. Uh, there were some people that wrote after him, um, but not too much later. You know, down into about the 300s um, is when you start getting things like Ezra and Nehemiah. And so those were some of the last ones. But but Isaiah was a, a very important book. It's where the prophecies for the Messiah came from. Many of them. And so that, if, if ever the Pope was going to change something, you would have thought it would have been something like Isaiah that dealt with the, the prophecies of the coming Messiah, right? Um, because it, by and large, after the New Testament, if somebody was going to change anything, it would probably have been something that, that dealt with Jesus now that Jesus has come versus just facts of the Old Testament. That, that wouldn't have had as much of an importance. And so if a book like Isaiah is still word for word, um, then it gives us a lot of, of strength to know that they were able to keep these things together. And then we have several copies of Genesis and Exodus. Deuteronomy was, was probably the biggest book that they lived by in those days prior to Christ, right in that uh, window of from 200 B.C. to uh, the time of Christ. Deuteronomy was, was the book. 